This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. My guest today is Vinny Tolman. Vinny, I am so excited to have you here today. I'm excited to be here. So excited to be here. Well, for those of you that are listening, if you want to get just tons of information about what it's like on the other side and how you should live your life, Vinny had such a detailed near-death experience. So we're going to have him step us through it. So Vinny, take us to the day that you had your near-death experience. Well, um, this day was a Saturday. It was uh, Saturday, January 18th. It was 2003. So it was quite a while ago, but um, not that long ago for us in our 40s and 50s and 60s. <laughs> yes. You know, t- January 2003 was not that long ago, but yet it was a lifetime ago for some people. Right. Um, well, in this day, I was planning on going and doing a, a regular workout. I was in the process of doing bodybuilding. And we were going to go and have some breakfast, do a workout, as well as go to a little car show and look at some new cars that were being released back then. And uh, we had, me and my buddy, my best friend at the time, we had planned on using this very popular supplement. And this supplement you could buy everywhere. Um, But it was because it was so popular, it was sold out everywhere. And so we went online. We purchased some from a company in Thailand. We got this supplement. We took our normal little bottle cap of this liquid dose. And instantly we both felt something was off about this new stuff that we had gotten from Thailand. And uh, right away we knew it. And we knew knew also that with the supplement we were used to taking, if you got a little too much, you would just go eat some food and you would, your stomach would kind of settle out and you'd be fine. So we decided to go down the street to a a little Dairy Queen and grab a bite to eat. It was the morning hours, so we figured, hey, we could grab either some breakfast or some early lunch and let our stomachs kind of settle into this supplement. Well, we get to the the Dairy Queen, and and by the time we actually got there, my buddy was is starting to nod off. I'm like shaking him awake. Um, We get there. I put the car in park for him. And then I exited the, the, the car and went into the Dairy Queen and went straight to their bathroom and locked the door. And that was a, a, a big problem because nobody saw me go in. I came in so quick, I went in, locked the door. My buddy, um, he went in and he collapsed on a booth. Just, just inside the door, there was one of these big round booths. He collapsed down there and started to vomit. And so the manager called 911 and got an ambulance there and they hauled him away. And meanwhile, I, the way, what I was seeing was I saw the room get very, very dizzy. And then I remember feeling like the world was spinning on me. And as that was happening, I, I myself collapsed on the, on the ground. And the next thing I know, I'm actually looking down from above. And I'm watching them haul away my friend. I watched them take him away in an ambulance. And I was worried that he was, you know, I hope he's going to be okay. But I had, I had a sense of knowing that he was going to be fine. And watched him get taken away. And I'm sitting there watching all of this play out underneath me. Literally watching it from above, which was very weird for me. Very surreal. And I was hearing the thoughts of everyone below me, including the workers in the restaurant. And I was, uh, you know, witnessing all of this. And I noticed this one customer, he kept trying to go use the bathroom and the door was locked. So he tried he, again and again and again. And after about 45 minutes of him trying to open that door, he went to the manager and said, hey, I think someone may have inadvertently locked that door. Um, and, and also they might have left their phone in there because I keep hearing a phone ring and nobody's answering it. So the manager went over there and knocked on the door. He opened it up and he found this dead guy, this dead guy on the ground. Um, he had, he called 911 again. He called the emergency services again. He coached his worker, his, his girl that was like his assistant manager. He coached her on what to do while he was on the phone with with 911 and he he told her you know uh, feel for a pulse 
And as she was feeling around the body, she, she cringed and said that it's cold already. It's cold. So, um, the fact that they, they notated it, the body was cold. They went ahead and just secured the room and waited for the emergency services to arrive to ascertain what to do next. And shortly thereafter, just a few minutes later, an ambulance did come on scene. This ambulance was a three-man team. It was two, two veteran medics and one rookie medic. The rookie medic was sitting in the jump seat, which is in the back. And they, they came on scene. Um, the, the rookie was kind of uh, directed to stay outside and to just observe. So he did. He, he was monitoring and observing everything. He saw them attempt resuscitating the body. He saw them try for a few minutes. And after only a few minutes, they, they, they called it, they called time of death. And they called what, what's considered a DOA or dead on arrival um, proclamation. And, and so they were proclaiming the body as dead. They went ahead and, uh, you know, different ambulances in different areas. Some of them carry body bags, others don't. This one happened to have body bags. So they, they pull out a body bag and they, they bag the body put it in the back of the, the ambulance, and, and they strapped it down the way they would a dead body. It had straps everywhere, very tight. They, they put this body in the back of the ambulance, and this whole time I was watching it happen, and I wasn't recognizing it was my body. I really didn't. I was recognizing that me was up here watching everything and hearing everything. I could hear what was going on in the mind of this rookie medic he was really upset and he wanted to make a difference he wanted to feel like he he didn't feel that they tried hard enough to resuscitate this body so he went ahead and just kept thinking i wish we could have done something different he was sitting there staring at the body as it was just sitting in the back of the ambulance while the other two medics went around and got paperwork filled out on the different witnesses and on the manager um, they were getting some paperwork filled out. As they did, um, they went ahead and loaded into the ambulance and started to leave. Um, and they, and a police officer showed up and they traded some paperwork with the police officer. And then they left the scene. As they left, this medic, he really started to beat himself up and think, man, I really wish we could have done something different for him. For this guy, I wish we could have done something different. And as he had this thought, he actually started to glow like his actual presence started to glow in the heart space like the heart area actually started to glow in that area on him and i noticed that it started to glow and then i heard a very loud male energy come over me and say and and it actually talked it said this one's not dead and I knew the medic, I knew this rookie, he heard it because when he heard it, he, he went rigid and, and looked around. He looked around to see if this message had come from someone else nearby. And he realized it didn't. It was, you know, he, he felt it must have been his imagination. And so he shrugged it off as, you know, you were imagining things. And we went further down the road. And now all of a sudden this glow, it got brighter and it started to glow from above his head to all the way to his waist and, and was very, very bright coming from him. He was actually glowing. And for the second time, I heard, this one's not dead. Now, the second time he heard it, um, that was enough for him to begin the, the, the path of, of resuscitation. He went ahead and undid a couple of the straps on the body. He unzipped the body bag and started feeling around. He couldn't feel any pulse. He went all the way to the inner thigh uh, where he had to get another, another strap taken off so he could even feel on the inner thigh. As he went to the inner thigh, um, I felt an, igni a, an ignition or a spark between me uh, up here watching and him down there. I felt it. like I felt an actual spark where it made me jump and he jumped too. And that was enough for him that he went ahead and threw out protocol and he began to actually resuscitate the body. Uh, he hooked up a defib machine. He hooked up uh, some equipment to bring uh, oxygen into the lungs. And he went through that process of, of resuscitation. 
the first round of shocks to the heart didn't do anything. The second round, it did get a single heartbeat and then flatline. And then the third round of shocks, he got a steady and a faint heartbeat to start. And from that point, the body started to come back alive. And, and I say the body because still at this point, I didn't see it as my body. I saw it as a body and it didn't look like me. The neck had actually gone really wide and swollen and the skin was purple, like very bright purple with yellow blotches. And it, it didn't look human. It, it actually looked like a, like a bad Hollywood job. Like, you know, somebody trying to make up a dead body and they didn't do a very good job. Uh, it looked, looked artificial. It didn't look real. And as I'm wa- witnessing all this, they got the body to come, you know, to, the heart to start back up. And this all happened one block away from a hospital. So they were able to go pull directly into a hospital um, even though they, their plans were to deliver this body to the, the county medical examiner so, you know, to, so that they could do what they needed to do with the body. But as soon as they got the heart started, they, they knew, oh, we're going to go over to this hospital. And one of the blessings is this hospital had a cardiology specialty there. So they were able to get, get and do the work that needed to happen right away for that body. And as but- they were – go ahead – but two of the medics were not very happy, right? Oh, no. They were yelling at him. In fact, they were they were chewing him out. They were saying, you're going to get fired. You, you're breaking protocol. They were they were actually, until the, the defib machine started making its bells and alarms, they actually weren't even aware of him doing this in the back. Um, until the defib machine started making the noise that it makes, when they saw that, they looked back and saw him doing it. And, and they were like, you can't do this. You're going to get fired. You're brand new. Don't do this. And they, they really tried to dissuade him. But what's funny is the second round of shocks when there was one heartbeat, um, both, both the other two medics kind of like shut up and, and hushed up and realized, whoa, something's going on here. And when the third round came, they, they didn't even have to talk to each other. They knew exactly what to do. They pulled into this hospital. They had, they had just radioed just seconds earlier we've got a dead body we're bringing, you know, or we've got a guy with, with, uh, you know, they, they described the whole situation and the hospital was able to meet them with a trauma team. And so, you know, as they were doing all of this and they were, they're transferring the body from the ambulance into the hospital, uh, they had to switch it over to a hospital gurney and, and they were doing this. The body went into all site, all types of seizures and into uh, some convulsions and so they had to strap the body down. And as they strapped the body down, that's when I felt them strap me down. And that was the first instance I felt that what I had been witnessing was actually me. And that was a very, very scary moment for me personally. I, I, I felt completely surrounded by love and, and this very positive energy up until this happened. And as I realized that what I was watching was me, it was like all this fear started to flood into me and all this uh, self-judgment started to flood into me. And I actually had the thought, you idiot, how could you not know you're watching your own death this whole time? And I just felt so ignorant. I felt so, so defeated. And as I was feeling this, I actually started to see all the bad things I ever did in my life. Every little thing to every big thing that I'd ever done in my life, including I saw it from the perspective of those who I'd done it to, not just from my own perspective. And I saw that sometimes what I felt was not even an influence at all, was a major influence in other people's lives. And then I saw other places where I thought I was making a difference and, or making an influence, and I wasn't making an influence at all. And as I was... A, you know, um, expressing or experiencing the past, my mistakes, I then started to see and feel this warmth come around me from behind. I felt this warmth uh, start around from my back and, and come around to me. And I started to feel this, this love. And it, it started to permeate me and, and become part of me. And this love and this light it started to show me all the good that I had ever done. 
it started to show me all the people I'd ever helped, all the people I'd ever made a positive impact on. And not just from my perspective, but their perspective as well. And in a flash, I was able to see the dramatic difference that, that my life had made on other people's lives in a positive way. And I started to feel this very strong feeling that I was worth existing. I was worth living. I was worth being. And that's when I felt this all loving presence behind me. And I turned around to see what looked like God. I turned around to see this, this man all dressed in white with a long white beard and, and longer white hair and just loving piercing eyes. These eyes were just, they felt like they were holding me in their, in their, their arms. And as I looked at this being, I, my first thought was, Oh, you must be God. And the, the first thing that happened was this being started to laugh and said, no, I'm not God. But I realized that he said it without saying words, without using his mouth. And I, I noticed that I was communicating with him instantly. And so my follow-up thought was, if you're not God, then are you Jesus? And I was confused about it because like, if you're not God, but I can tell you're, you're like a godlike figure. You're exuding this love for me that I've never felt from anything or anyone in my life. And it's so strong, you have to be some, some part of God. And, and he explained that, no, he's not Jesus either, but that he was sent in God's love to assist me and to guide me. And he would take me wherever I wanted to go. And um, I explained that I wanted to go wherever he came from. Wherever this, this energy was that he brought with him, I wanted to go to the source of that energy. And he explained that, he, that where he came from was my original home. That's also where I had come from originally. And that he could take us home. And so I said, let's go. Let's, let's, let's go do this. He did ask me, though, I can take you back to your body. And I, I didn't even want to entertain that thought. I wanted to go with him where that love that I was feeling from him. I wanted to go towards that. So we began our process. We began this journey towards what I call heaven or home. And this journey wasn't easy. It was actually kind of hard because I was raised Christian. I was raised to believe that I had everything I needed to get to heaven. And I actually didn't. There was quite a bit that I had to learn. And I especially had to embody and and learn these 10 principles that are, were earth-shaking for me. They really shook up my paradigm and shook up my belief system. And they really awakened the God spark or the ignition of, of God's light within me. And uh, so we went across this process. Now, I was in a coma for three days. So they did bring my body back. They got my heart back. They got um, some of my other systems back. The neuro neurological system was the last to come back. It did take three full days where I had very little brain activity. Um, and, and I was essentially clinically brain dead for three days while I was in a coma. And for those three days, I was in heaven. I was, I was traveling towards our home, our original home, and experiencing these amazing principles um, and embodying these principles. And then as I embodied that last principle, I actually got to heaven, to our home. I got to the actual place we would consider heaven or home, where we all came from. And I got to experience, um, I, I call it the tourist visa version of heaven. I was there on a short turnaround for three days. And I got to experience what heaven is, what it's built of, and what its purpose is. And um, I got to be healed by just the process of being there. It changed me. It definitely changed me. And it allowed me to become who I am now. But I got to experience a place 
where if you could even understand the amount of love in a single blade of grass in heaven, you would completely change how you live your day, every live your life every day. You would change it. If you could feel how much love is in a single blade of grass for us there, you would change everything about how you live here. And unfortunately, there is a reason why we can't remember heaven. We can't remember our home, where we came from. And it's because if we felt that strong of a love, we would just automatically make the right decisions to support and uplift that love. And for us to truly have our independence, we have to be washed in a veil of forgetfulness so that we can have our independence to make choices here and to live in earth school, because that's what it is. Earth is a school, to live in earth school and to grow here and then return back home with what we learned. And, uh, you know, it, it was very amazing to have this experience as I was in heaven feeling this amazing experience. I got to see the healing power of, of God's love for us. Uh, you know, I always envision God as being male and being the, the evangelical God that we, that I learned about as a kid and in my Christian faith and come to find out God is so much more. God is the divine masculine and the divine feminine. God is everything. God is us. God is that love that we share for each other. God is everything, literally the, the all, the everything. And as I got to heaven, I realized that God is so much bigger than what our brains can comprehend God to be. And that's why we have so many religions, is because that's our, uh, our attempt at trying to understand who God is. And that if you go to the, the center or the core if you go to the center or the core of, of, of all of these religions, you will find God there. You'll find God. <clears throat> You'll find an aspect and a, a piece of God there in all the different religions. And um, I was amazed to see how God has permeated this universe in all aspects of existence. But we, we tend to not see our source, our creator there, because we're so distracted. We're so distracted with our, our technology. We're so distracted with <clears throat> all the different distractions we allow ourselves that we don't even see our creator, our, our source, our God, looking right back at us in a mirror in our own, in our own eyes. And, uh, you know, I was able to have this amazing experience there where I felt, I felt how much God loves every single one of us. Right before I was sent back to, to earth, I was there experiencing heaven and the amazing uh, trees and the flowers and the grass and the water, the healing waters. I was experiencing all of this. And as I was experiencing that, my guide, he came to me. And he said, he said, Vinny, this is going to be very hard, but it's going to be worth it. And he put his arms around me to hug me. And there you're able to experience a real hug. What we do here is, is a version of a hug, but it's not a real hug. The real hug that he gave me was this coming together of pure energy and pure love. And as, as we, did, we came together in pure love and energy, I felt the, the tremendous power of our two energies together. That when we were together in love and caring for each other, we became eight times more powerful than what we ever could have been on our own. And that there was a real principle in that. That, you know, when we are gathered in God's name, we are very impactful, much more impactful than we can ever be on our own. And as I felt this healing love, this, this love that just poured all over me and healed me, healed me of the traumas that I'd received over my life. 
I then actually felt how much God loves us. And I don't mean me. There's nothing special about me. But I'm telling you, like, God loves every single one of us so much. God feels that we are a divine masterwork. That it took so much to bring us into existence. And it takes so much energy to get us through existence. To get us through earth school. And to get us back home to heaven. That that process is only for the cream of the crop the best of the best, and for us to exist here on earth in the human form, we are that. We are that. And from this point of this hug that he gave me, I was forced back into my body and I woke up. I woke up at 1.11 in the morning after the third full day in the hospital, in my coma. And I... I worked and I worked and I worked to check myself out of that hospital. It took me six hours of convincing the staff there to let me go. They all thought that I was going to relapse and go back into some type of unconsciousness and that I was just having a good day right before I was going to drop off. And, and that does happen to people, but I knew it wasn't my path. I knew that I was going to be okay. I knew with every fiber of my being that I needed to leave and I needed to go live my life. And so I, I did go through that process of getting myself checked out. And, you know, again, I woke up at 1.11 in the morning. By, by about 7.30 in the morning, my, my father had come and I was able to be picked up by him to leave the hospital after three full days. And I celebrate my death anniversary. And my, and my reawakening anniversary, because both are important days to me. Um, you know, January 18th and January 21st. These are the days where my life was transformed, you know, 20 years ago now. It's been 20 years. This, this last January, it became my 20th death anniversary and my 20th reawakening. And I do live my life completely different now from what I learned. Just the, just the 10 principles alone that I learned from, from my guide have, have really changed me. One of those principles is understanding the hour of power, that we, we have this precious time when we first wake up and this precious time right before we go to bed. And whatever we put in that special time, we will frame our existence with. We will frame our paradigm with. And if we want to frame that with chaos or entertainment or news, we will see the world through a frame of chaos or entertainment or news. And if we want to frame our day with positive energy, with, you know, positive podcasts, um, with uh, the words of, of, of divine teachers, the words of ascended masters, if we want to really fill our hour of power with something precious, we will have a precious paradigm. We will have a view on the world that everything's happening for a reason. And it's up to us to figure it out. It's up to us to, to learn to find the silver linings on every cloud because there is a silver lining on every cloud. And, and every cloud will eventually go away and bring out a sunny day. And, and it's focusing on those silver linings that brings us there and puts us in that position. And, you know, come to find out, I... I met this amazing angel right after my experience and she later became my wife. As we were dating, I was, I was describing my guide all the time to her. She had so many questions. She always was asking, well, does he look like this? What is it? You know, what's his beard look like? And, and as I would see people that look like him, I would describe him. And over the months that followed, she felt in her mind, in her mind's eye, she thought she had a pretty good vision of who this guy looked like, what he looked like. And what was neat is, is um, my reawakening was January 21st when I left the hospital. On July 4th weekend, that following, that, that same year, we went to a little town in Wyoming called Afton, Wyoming. And, and we saw a presentation on the history of the little town of Afton. 
And in the, in the presentation, we saw this big screen and they had some slides coming up on the screen. And one of the slides was this gentleman who looked like my guide. I didn't see it right at first. I was looking away, but my, my girlfriend at the time who became my wife, she saw this and said, Vinny, that's your guide. I think that's your guide. And I remembered it as like, that can't be my guide. And when I saw it though, I knew I, I couldn't say anything. I was speechless. I was sitting there looking at the human face of my guide in heaven, but in real life. And up to this point, up to this point, it was debatable whether my experience was real or not. It was debatable. There was people on both sides of the debate saying it was real, it wasn't real, it was real, it wasn't real. And when I saw the face of this man who I'd never seen before in my life, I knew, I knew it was real. My experience was real. And come to find out, the, the, the image of the man I was seeing was my great, great, great grandfather on my grandmother's side. Someone I had never heard his name. I'd never seen his picture. And here he was, larger than life, as my guide while I was in heaven. And, he, and, and not just that, he was working with me continually. He's, he has been working with me continually for 20 years. He's been working with me as one of my guides. He still works with me daily. And what I, I really take from this experience is we are so much bigger and more important than we could know. Every single one of us. We are this divine masterwork that God talks about, that God cares so much about. And we all have this ability, if we want, to connect and activate that, that piece of God within all of us so that we can awaken that connection and, and build it and strengthen it so that we can have God in our own life. No matter what name we want to give God, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. But what does matter is our connection to God. That is what matters. And that's what my takeaway was from my experience, is I learned how important that connection to God is. So much so that I've, I've created a nonprofit for that purpose. It, and it's called Wonderful. Living, yeah, Living God's Light. And this is to help people activate that God spark inside them and help them bring about that direct connection with the creator, with source, no matter what name they want to put on source. Yeah. And that's my experience. That's my experience. Well, I have so many questions about <laughs> um, just the various things you learned. I want to hear more about heaven, but I'm really curious about this. We are going to continue this discussion in the next episode. If you think this was good so far, it gets even better. Thanks so much for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. That was part one. Make sure to listen to part two. And if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more episodes.